it's one of my favorite times of year. In the winter, we can travel on the snow and go just about anywhere we want. normal for us to be isolated at this time of year and we're fortunate in that we prepare for it. It's not so normal for the rest of the world and we really feel the sadness and uncertainty coming from everywhere, even out here. The thing that helps me during this time is just spending time outside and remembering that as big as our problems are, the human component of this world is just a small one. And there's a lot going on outside of our lives. This place isn't my house. This is where I've come with my family to do a 14 day isolation because we've returned to Australia from France. We're surrounded by rainforest and dairy farms. The nearest town is more than 30 kilometers away. And it's quite comforting to be surrounded by nature. Every day the sun rises, the birds, the splendid fairy wrens, hang out in the bushes and go about their daily chores. The kangaroos come and eat the grass and many elements of nature just have their life and do their thing and they're obviously oblivious to human troubles, which is really comforting. Actually, I don't feel isolated. Here I am looking out into vast Australian bush which ordinarily seems isolating, but you realize you're not isolated whatsoever here. You're part of something else. Your one already has enough. For myself, that's a nice realization that actually, um, when you isolate from one thing, you, you join another thing. And I guess being a part of something you can't be isolated you're not by yourself nobody's by themselves with this actually <laughs> We're 29 stories up. We have a pretty great view all around us. Uh, what's been really interesting is to see everyone who's working from home. And really, it's been illuminating in a city that often gets accused of having a lot of empty homes to see just how many of these homes aren't empty. So it's been really cool to be made aware of just how many neighbors you have and how all of us are carrying on in this very uncertain time. It's just been an interesting perspective on urban life and a reminder that we're all in it together. I've rented my house out, but I was visiting to check in on things, and so I ended up staying. I'm staying in the garage, sleeping in the hammock. It's actually quite pleasant, getting a lot of work done, and keeping really healthy.
The house feels great in times like these because I have a, a huge battery and solar panel system. So we have plenty of power. I also have 20,000 gallons of water that I get off my roof and my neighbor's roof. It's all nicely filtered. We have composting toilets. We started some gardens and so nothing much changes. I think it's causing people to think about what's important in their lives, who and what. It's also very interesting in that obviously the economy is doing terrible and there's some terrible things about it, but we realize that we all can join together and do incredible things. The world can change on a dime if we have to or if we want to. The silver lining of all of this will be that we will be getting a run through of pandemics and black swans and the fact that a hurricane can also occur at the same time as you're having a pandemic. So hopefully we will do a lot better emergency preparedness and hopefully this will help us think more about climate change and the long term things that are way, way cheaper to spend money on now than later. And, uh, and also just be focused on what matters. Well, this is the uh, kitchen table, the dining room table, where we eat all our meals. Uh, the table is made out of 3 by 10 Douglas fir, used Douglas fir uh, rafters out of a um, horse barn. And so, but this is our usual view here, most commonly out the window. And the, the feature about this here for us is the birds. We put down bird seeds out the window, and we have hundreds of birds every day. And in the background is, is a chicken coop that you can see with a living roof. When Leslie and I first got together about 45 years ago, we were both interested in homesteading. We wanted to build a house and grow as much of our own food as possible. There's some things uh, like scarlet runner beans actually are perennials and they'll grow back from the same root every year. This is uh, broom corn millet. It looks like corn, but it's millet. And when I say a, homes, a homestead in the sense that there's a house and a garden and we pretty much do as much as we can right on this piece of land. Uh, These are hollyhock flowers that make natural dyes and I'm just collecting them from my hollyhock plant. So we built our own house, we established a garden, we built a chicken coop. Actually, we built five different chicken coops. This is where they hang out at night. And then they go into those nests and lay eggs. Looks like she just dropped an egg. With respect to staying at home or it, it's interesting that shelter in place I mean our company name is shelter and our well beloved book is called shelter but one of the things about staying home for us is it doesn't really make too much difference these are oats here here's millet so that's a crop for sauerkraut So it's got a water seal around here. So it's gonna smell kind of bad. Leslie hates the smell of it. Uh, a lot of what we did was, were based on ideas that people had in the 60s and 70s. It, back in those years, it was possible to do something like this because it was easy living. 
in America. You could get by in very little money. And so um, we realized right early on that you can't be entirely self-sufficient. That self-sufficiency is like a direction. You aim in that direction, but you never really get there. This is my latest book. We've been at it for 46 years here. So here's our house and here's the interior. There's about 500 photographs in this book. Leslie's bread, all sourdough. We haven't bought bread for maybe hardly any for maybe 10 years. This is a sourdough based dough that I feed. This is just the starter and I started with a small amount of flour and water sitting in my kitchen for several days. It's just the bacteria that's in your kitchen. It's in the air and, and obviously on all the counters and everything. And uh, you can just then add flour and a little, you know, they sell sourdough starters, but you can start with water and flour in your kitchen, incorporating really the bacteria that's in your kitchen. So it's local. Yeah, yeah, go, go around over here. Just sort of move quietly. Staying at home for me means I'm more in touch with the local things. <laughs> the moon and the wind and the tides. I have more of a, a feeling of continuity. Because I live in a 700 square foot one bedroom apartment, what is that, 65 square meters? It's a small space. I have to get creative about storage. Behind this Murphy bed, I have a little bit of space that I put in some plywood shelves and store things that last a long time. And it's easy to reach in here, get the things that I need. I don't want to be a crazy hoarder. I don't want my house to look like an insane person lives here. So I have a simple bedroom, but I have managed under this mattress, it's a queen size mattress, to fit 24 five gallon buckets and each bucket has a different dry goods in it. So there's rice and there's beans and there's lentils, just all kinds of different things. And this is p the visible part of a food storage system that I actually learned from Mormons in Utah. So every time I sort of run low at something like this, I recharge the bottle in my five gallon buckets. So I'll buy 25 pounds of something. When this bottle is empty, I fill it up from the bucket. When the bucket is empty, I buy another 25 or 50 pound sack of the stuff. It's really inexpensive. It's really healthy. It's simple. And it's also part of my emergency preparedness thing because I live in an earthquake zone. Here, it gives me easy access to, I do a lot of dehydrating. So when there's a lot of produce coming in, whether it's from the garden in the country or whether it's the farmer's market, I can get carrots and celery and onions and all sweet peppers and things, and I can buy them in bulk or harvest them from the garden. I can slice them up, dehydrate them, put them in jars. They take up a lot less space when you remove the water. And I have this stuff at hand for when I'm cooking. One of the things that I consider, because I do live in earthquake country, is that there needs to be a way of cooking in case the electricity and the natural gas supply get cut off. 
and I have lots of propane out in the back patio in this little sort of dead waste space between buildings where I can have a barbecue, I can have multiple propane paint tanks. These cooking implements, there's a, a North African tagine, there's a fondue pot, there's all sorts of things that you never know when you might need them. If you can keep things going with a little can of Sterno, it actually could come in handy, like, like in an earthquake when the power goes out. It might be handy to have a tagine so that you can, you can cook things outdoors on the propane grill, even in an open fire if you absolutely had to. This is honey, I keep these on my roof, and this is just some of the honey, most of it I give it away. People are like, you know, do you really expect to like feed yourself and your friends and your neighbors off of the stuff you grow on your roof? And I say, it's not really the point. <laughs> that, I mean, that's, it's not really the point. Like I can make a fair amount of honey. I can get a five or six gallons of honey from my roof hives over the year if I do a couple of extractions. And I can, you know, between my little roof and our, or the neighbor's roof, we can, we can grow lots of our leafy greens. And... That's my neighbor Sarah's garage roof. And in the, in the growing season, we could probably grow a lot more even in the winter, but we've sort of let it go. We've got figs and lemons and all kinds of leafy greens. But it's not about growing wheat on your roof. It's just about a, a learning curve, knowing how to do things, having worked out all the kinks. And if we needed to, we could really ramp up production. We've got a lot of acreage up here that we could grow a lot of food for lots of people, if, if we ever needed to. And plus it's fun, you know, like you get to know your neighbors just by doing stuff like this. We are very lucky we have a veranda. It's actually larger than our kitchen here in Korea. But for the most part, we never really see any neighbors. We live in a, in a city of 1.5 million, but usually people stay inside. It's arts and crafts hour here. We don't know how many hours, weeks, months we're gonna be doing this. So we're just trying to make the best of it. Right now we're working on a model made out of popsicle sticks and chopsticks and cardboard. We had some ideas kicking around for a build in the summer of 2020, if summer of 2020 ever comes around. Yeah, we tried to build uh, a new unit on our property every summer, and we've been doing that for the past three years. So we're just kind of using the skills that we have and the, the property and the kind of ethos of our uh, resort village there, if you want to call it that. I'm just sticking true to it, you know, building things that are within our capabilities that fit with nature and um, that are kind of foolproof and fail-proof from the elements. And less than 200 square feet. Yeah, so uh, mostly things can be built within two or three weeks. That seems to be kind of our MO. Two or three weeks, stuff we can buy from Home Depot or recycle. And... Oh, just something unique. So we came across a brand new kind of idea and it was just by jotting it down on paper, I kind of had a difficult time visualizing it. So we decided, hey, why not try to build a model? We've never done anything like this and we're not builders or architects by trade. We don't want to build a typical like square or rectangle box. So we really enjoyed the, the angular uh, shapes of this and it kind of reminds us of like triangles and so we kind of wanted to go with that theme. And we like the idea of like actually coming up through it kind of like it's treehouse-esque. So you save on uh, swinging doors and such. Here on the deck they can maybe take out their mattress into the deck and sleep under the stars. Uh, the mattresses we have uh, researched and come up, came up with are quite unique. Um, so it's I think like 10 inch foam mattress and basically they come in trifold. So uh, unfolded it's a queen size mattress and folded it's basically like a little couch that you can hang out on. So if it was folded into a couch, then people have more space and they can just kind of hang out. It's uh, very much camping, glamping. They can hang here in the hammocks, they could cook, and just to be able to enjoy the nature. And that's kind of the whole 
purpose of our resort. We want people to get back to nature, to disconnect, to just enjoy the things that are around us, not the technology and the... We're planners, so this like kind of fits into what we do anyways, but just really being encouraged not to go outside is just... We've never built a model as elaborate as this. Not that it's elaborate, but... <laughs> So I've lived in my tiny house for about five years. For about the last two years, my tiny house has been located in the city of Charlotte in someone's backyard. And then in August of last year, the city of Charlotte required that I move my house. So I had to relocate it to a farm that's about 25, 30 minutes outside Charlotte. You have some flexibility about what you can do in rural areas, more flexibility, I would say, than um, in the city of what you can do as far as you know, a tiny house and more so on a farm. But as I've said from the beginning, as one of the few black people early on in the tiny house movement is that rural areas being more accepting of tiny houses, that's just not the safest location for black people in the tiny house movement. So out in this area, it's isolated. It's 11 acre farm, it's in development or under development and just kind of up and coming. So I was the only person living out there. My safety became a concern for me. I did deal with some incidences of racism. and the weather. So it's an open field, no tree cover, so the wind comes through there. And it's, so it's scary just on a regular windy day. And then a couple of storms came through that got really scary for me. And, you know, I just grabbed my stuff and kind of left the house because I wasn't comfortable there. So I started thinking and had to make a, a decision based more on personal happiness. I still adore my house, but that's not the location that I imagined in my tiny house dream. You know, I'm a city girl, I wanna be in the city. I get my energy from the city. I felt isolated and kind of disconnected out there. And so I started looking for an apartment back in the city. It was a tough decision because, you know, adding an expense of an apartment when one of my major points for my tiny house was to reduce my ex expenses. So now I'm adding an expense, but I'm big on, you know, following your dream and, and dreaming new dreams when the dream changes and you need to do something different. So I got an apartment in the city of Charlotte and then the stay in place order went into effect. And so as that happened, the thing that just kept repeating itself in my mind was, this is exactly where I would want to be right now. I normally work from home. I have for the last 13 years or so. And I would say I'm really an introvert. So I 
have jokingly said that I feel like I've been practicing for this time period to stay in place. But while I can see this as a break, there are others who see this as a storm and it's disconcerting for them. And then there are still others who see this as a hurricane and it's ripping things apart, their lives, the things that they're having to deal with. While many people are pushing and rushing to, you know, to get back to normal, now I think we really have to evaluate and reset what normal looks like. Because it's clear from what's been going on that the black community has been impacted far too much and for far too long or we've been impacted by the effects of structural racism. The health disparities for our communities. This virus is disproportionately taking black lives due to the compounded health problems and living conditions within our communities that don't allow for social distancing. The lack of access to quality food and adequate medical care within our communities, which all are due to structural and systemic racism. It's really way past time for these disparities to be addressed and for them to be resolved. We have to learn from this, you know, it, it just can't be a, a getting back to normal or going back to normal because now is the time that we have to challenge what has been the status quo for too long. It has to be, in my opinion, a permanent resetting of the current structures and the current systems and the resetting has to be designed by the people who are actually being impacted and for the people who are actually being impacted. I have this memory. When I was young, I would visit my grandmother and this feeling I remember clearly every time is how quiet the house was. Now this was a long time ago and I always tell myself my mind's playing tricks on me, but I like to think it was, I don't know, Lack of electronic gadgets in the house. No machines, no computers, buzzing. Now, I don't know what it was, but I know that I've always longed for this. This deep quietness. And basically my entire life has been around trying to figure out a way to live in that peace. Now, one could argue that I could find that peace within myself and the image of a ascetic man meditating among the traffic and the noise. Yeah, peace can be found anywhere, but I tried to build this surrounding, this environment where I can find this. And of course, it's a never ending journey. Although I like to aim for that peace, I have a very busy mind. So it's been a challenge for me as well. And not being able to go out as much, meet people, 
get disturbed, so to say. It's by force bringing me back to, you know, just focusing on being here now. And I hope, after all the pain and the trouble and the financial crisis, I hope that we can keep that when it's over. We can keep just a taste of the, the simple peace, the slower pace that we had a chance to taste. It is quieter now, but I am no stranger to silence, to solitude, or to quietude. Today is Easter Sunday. Many services are suspended. My life goes on as before. I read, reflect, write. The French mathematician Blaise Pascal said, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. I think a balanced person is someone who is comfortable both being alone as well as being with others. In that way, we will be able to handle whatever life throws out at us. If you let stirred up cloudy water to settle, eventually it will become clear. We all can be stirred up by live events and silence has this ability to settle our shaken self so we can see things clearly sitting still long enough to allow the sediment to settle such that our judgment is not clouded This may seem like the darkest time. This may seem like a time of alienation and anxiety. And indeed, it is a challenging time. But as my Zen teacher always tells us, to keep the hundred year view, uh, to look beyond this current moment, This is actually not my window, I'm in my roommate's bedroom. He's with his family, so he kindly let me use it as a home recording studio so I can keep working. Usually I'm alone, working in a beautiful, soundproof, six-floor studio at a music house in Chelsea. Not so soundproof anymore.
I'm currently scoring three films, including this one, and it made me realize that nowadays we live in an incredible time where anyone with a laptop, for example, can work on a project from anywhere. In this tough time of crisis, I'm finding comfort at home. I guess what I'm trying to say is that in normal times, if you have the luxury to be able to work from home and to be with the ones you love a little bit more, it's pretty incredible. La Casa Común es un proyecto para cuestionar los límites y las fronteras que hacemos y ponemos. Animamos a quien quiera a enviarnos su casa. La Casa Común Quiere poner en un mismo lugar eh, las diferentes posibilidades de, de hacer hogar. O sea, estamos recogiendo casas desde esos diferentes puntos del globo y las vamos a poner en un mapa gigante. Eso, y para nosotros es muy importante señalar que aunque vivamos cada uno en nuestra casa, hay una única casa, que es la casa de todos, que es el planeta Tierra, que compartimos un solo mundo, que es el que tenemos, el que tenemos que cuidar, que no es infinito y que nos va la vida en ello. ¿no? En algún artículo leo los consejos de la experiencia de un astronauta y sus meses en el espacio. Te dicen evitar el miedo. En algún video escucho a una abuela que cuenta de su reclusión en un pozo durante tres años en el periodo del holocausto judío. Es una oportunidad para pensarnos como especie. Singularidad histórica planetaria. Esta vez estamos todos los humanos atravesados por lo mismo. Thank you.